joined today by Carlos Gill. Um, I have kept in touch, for lack of better terms, have kept up with Carlos Gill for almost a decade. And Carlos Gill, uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but he's got a very interesting background. He's also the best-selling author of The End of Marketing, Humanizing Your Brand in the Age of Social Media and AI. Um, and uh, the book, well, right there it is. Okay, so the book looks like this. It's a great book. Um, it, it's got, it's just has a lot of great information. The thing I like about this book so far, Carlos, is that mm -hmm. it's not just your typical social media book. It separates social media from being an influencer and so on. Anyway, Carlos, welcome to the show. Bert, it's so good to be here with you. Thank you. So let's talk about this. Uh, like I said, uh, you and I were talking pri pri prior to the show starting mm -hmm. about your background with the Pink Slip Party. So tell everybody about what that is and, and how you got started. Yeah, such a good question. And it's one that I don't get asked a lot of nowadays because most people that meet me, they, they come across me on YouTube or they see me speak at a conference. So I started my career in financial services and in banking at the beginning of the 2000s. So in 2002, got my first job, professional corporate job working at Citigroup. From there, I went to go work at AIG. And right around 2008, I got laid off in the banking industry. And uh, this was the height of the recession and financial crisis. And uh, back then, I was, I was significantly younger than I am now. I was 25. And I didn't have any social media presence whatsoever. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, these were all new social networks back then right. and uh, at the advice of my mom i joined linkedin the same day that i lost my job and I, I started connecting with people i started joining groups and it was by joining groups that i realized wow i'm really not alone in this there are thousands of people also gravitating to linkedin all saying the same thing you know i just lost my job does anyone know who's hiring? And I lost my job in November of 2008. The month that I lost my job, hundreds of thousands of other professionals in the U.S. lost their jobs too. And it was right before the holiday season. And you know, for anyone that's ever been out on the job search and unemployed right around the holidays, you know that you know everything shuts down. Even even in, in business, right? Like in in small business, if you're an entrepreneur, this is the type of season. Uh, this is the, the time of the year where people are not thinking about you know, hiring or adding new vendors. Business kind of stalls. So in the six to eight weeks that I had of severance pay, I knew I need to stretch this as far as I possibly can. So I started an online job board called Jobs Direct USA. Now, in full disclosure, 25 years old, Bert, I knew nothing about running a business, even though my parents are serial entrepreneurs. And when I was a teenager, I worked in their businesses. I really didn't know the ins and outs that go into running a business. I wasn't a good entrepreneur by any means, but what I did learn really, really well was how to get attention and how to make noise and how to connect with people, which in 2008 and nine and 10 was still so new. And I started doing these events called Pink Slip Parties, which were networking events to bring together those that are unemployed along with those that are hiring. And in order to grow the awareness for the Pink Slip Parties and actually get recruiters to go, I leveraged social media. I used platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter to find every single recruiter I could possibly connect with in the markets where I was doing these events, such as Atlanta and Miami, Orlando, Jacksonville, where I lived at the time. Um, and eventually these pink slip parties started to gain a lot of traditional media attention. So then I kind of growth hacked and figured out how to get the attention of media and you needed an angle and then you would take that angle and you would pitch it to reporters through platforms like Twitter, which back then weren't as saturated as they are today. So putting a, a bow on a very long story and making it short, the pink slip party in itself continued to gain momentum. Carlos Gill, me started to get a lot of national momentum and attention. And this is a, kind of like the golden era of social media where you didn't have YouTube influencers and you didn't have all these influencers that were like, you know, clogging the digital streets for attention. Right. Um, you know, people like Gary Vee and Lewis Howes and, you know, others, like they very quickly built their brands because there wasn't all the noise that's being created today. And uh, as time went on and I did more of these pink slip parties, companies would start to hit me up to go consult for them on all things social media. And one of those companies was Winn-Dixie, which is one of the biggest sure. supermarket chains in the Southeast. And Winn-Dixie and I, we worked together for a period of time. And then ultimately they offered me a job to go run social media for them 
on a corporate level. And that's really where my career kind of hit a reset. And I went from being this kind of unemployed entrepreneur trying to help people find jobs to becoming a corporate marketing professional, which is how a lot of individuals that come across me today now, they know me as you know former head of social media at LinkedIn, BMC Software, Winn-Dixie. Um, and what the end of marketing really is, Bert, is a culmination of 10 years of working in the online marketing space, social media space. And it's really a brain dump. One of the reviews I read on Amazon was spot on. It's a brain dump of everything that I know um, to be true in terms of how social media works. And you know, you mentioned before, um, in terms of it being an easy read, I'm not a textbook marketer. And if you've ever seen me speak on stage at a conference, I like to compare my keynotes to, it's like a, it's like a hip hop concert to church, right? I preach the gospel of marketing to you, but in a very entertaining, a very easy to understand way while giving you actionable insights. And the book is just that. I didn't go to college to learn social media marketing or marketing in general. I learned all of this just through trial and error and a lot of A-B testing. And to be frank with you, a lot of spamming. And it was all those lessons that I learned early on. While I wasn't making money, like that's, that's the ironic thing that I want to call out. I wasn't making any money during the recession. I was barely getting by. And I'm really grateful for that experience because I learned much of what I know today just through the experience of being unemployed and having to roll up my sleeves and start up a business using these mediums. Sure, sure. That that was your, what do they call it? Paying your dues. That was that was your, uh, what do you call it? Sweat your, equity. Yeah, your sweat equity. And, and, and it's obviously done well for you because as I followed your career from the pink slip parties, which I thought were, what a great name. And it's something that, you know, for somebody else, maybe to pick that up and carry it forward because it's still something every, you know, no matter how good the economy is, somebody's always unemployed or changing or whatever. But from pink, pink slips parties to LinkedIn to now being a social influence yourself and uh, the book, again, the book is available on Amazon. I'll also, put, I'll also put a link in the notes. It's called The End of Marketing. And so let me ask you this. Um, today, based mm -hmm. on what you've seen, what does it take for a company to become relevant and stay relevant? Oh, man, that's such a, such a good question. First of all, relevancy isn't something that you can necessarily dictate the audience dictates it for you mm. so in order for you to be relevant that requires others to be talking about you and i think that the way marketing continues to evolve on these digital mediums um i, I like to use this term a lot when i'm on stage the inmates really run the asylum right and what the inmates are is the users you know i um it's funny because I, I spoke yesterday at the baseball winter meetings in san diego and i spoke to a bunch of executives for major and minor league baseball and what I told them is, look, you can only control what you can control. And that's very little. Right. You're going to sell merchandise and you're going to sell tickets. At the end of the day, it's up to people to show up and to root for your team and to buy those tickets and to sit in the stands, right? A lot of brands today feel that because they're Nike or they're Starbucks or they're, you know, insert company here, that they have all this infinite power. And there's a difference between having power in the real world in terms of dollars and cents and there's a difference between having power on the internet because you have social reach and relevancy and people like you. And that's something that I think most marketers, again, because in, in, in I would assume in college, they're not teaching you um, the theory of relevance. Um, most marketers think, well, because we're Nike, we have this amazing brand. Like, look, you and I are both wearing Nike right now. Have you noticed that? But yeah, there, there, there. Day, like, if I didn't do this show today, no one's going to really know that I'm even wearing a Nike apparel because I'm not right. talking about the brand. So relevance today is something that really depends on having people speak about you. And more importantly, for the company um, to be listening to ensure that you're engaging with the people that are mentioning you. And the internet I refer to throughout the marketing is this giant digital ocean. It's noisy. There's you know, digital noise being created every single second of the day, whether it's tweets or posts on Facebook or Instagram. And what brands need to stop doing is contribute to that noise and they need to do a better job listening to what's being said about them. Mm. 
I like that. I like that. It, because ultimately, yeah, if everybody is, it, it's the old saying, right? You have one mouth and two ears for a reason. So if everybody's making noise and nobody's listening, then mm -hmm. nothing, nothing's moving forward. But if brands are picking up on the noise and they're listening and they can say, hey, I, I hear you, I feel you, this is what we're doing or this is whatever, or they can, just, they, they can start the conversation or move it forward, that's going to be more, uh, what do you call it, uh, more relevant mm -hmm. than just putting out more content. It's going to be more impactful. So I'll give you an example. Uh, every time I sit with a potential client to work with, one of the first things I do is I go on Instagram and I type in hashtag their company name, assuming that they're a big enough brand. And I show them the thousands of mentions of their brand that they have never engaged with. Mm. And I share with them, this is an example of why your social media strategy today doesn't work. Because while you're focusing on creating all of this content, you have a very small subset of user that's even seeing the content. Very, very, very minuscule number by comparison. Right. If you were to just take a step back and not ever post ever again, you'll be completely fine. Because again, inmates run, run the asylum. The users itself on these platforms inherently are going to promote you one way or another. They're going to go into one of your stores, one of your cafes, one of your shops. They're going to wear your apparel. And at some point or another, they're going to tag your brand and mention your brand. And that's the opportunity for you to swoop in and engage with them and build relationships. Now, a big premise of the end of marketing is that people are brands today and people have influence. And the reality is that everyday people like you and I, we have the same access to the same tools as every celebrity and every major brand out there. Like that's what's great about the internet today is, is we all have really the same level playing field and the same competitive advantage um, where brands really are missing the mark and they're going to need to start doing a significantly better job besides listening is making people the faces of their brand. And the way that you do that is first of all, you tap into your employees. You, you you give authorization to your employees essentially to create content on your behalf, you make employees the faces of your brand, the mascots of your brand, and then your customers. You pay better attention to who's already talking about your brand, who's a customer, who's passionate, and then you allow them to tell the story or the narrative of how they use your products and services. Such a simple concept, Bert, but it's, 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 ironic that we're in almost the year 2020 and you have so many educated men and women that work at, you know, billion dollar corporations that don't understand it. Instead, they blame the algorithms and the fact that they don't have, you know, the resources that they need. Well, and I think part of that though is the overwhelm. It had, you know, because a few years ago, five, six years ago, maybe even three years ago, a social media manager was just pushing out content mm -hmm. and that's great. As you and I just said, Hey, that's first start. But depending on the size of your marketplace, maybe you need a social media listener. And, and so that takes a lot more time and a lot more work. And, 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 you know, depending on the layers of that company, I could just see, you know, somebody like a GE saying, well, you know, we got to get this approved and we, you know, you know how sometimes the corporations get so big that they're concerned about how things are said, how they're answered, especially in today, because if you say something that might be quote offensive, mm -hmm. you know, you know, people will just pile on, you know? So I think there's a little, you know, a little fear, intimidation of, man, what are we going to say? How are we going to say it? Who, you know, who can we trust to say it? But I like this concept of spending more time listening and responding versus just putting out more and more content. And I think that's, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's the shift that's happening. Mm -hmm. Because again, five years ago, it was just content and you put out stuff and blah, blah, blah. Today, it's different. People, the, 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 Yeah, the rules have changed. And you know, I often compare these social networks to casinos, right? And if you understand gambling ter terminology, then you, you would know that the casino is the house. And you know, I know this to be true because I used to work for a social network in LinkedIn. And these social networks are digital advertising platforms at the end of the day. Right. They want people to be on the platforms as long as possible, consuming as much content, because the longer that users are on the platform, the more ads that they can serve. And the more ads they can serve, the more money they can make. And that's how they keep the lights on and employ thousands of people right. um, 
at, at their business. So with, with that being said, you know, Bert, the, the rules have changed and marketers need to understand the rules have changed and play by the house rules if they want to win. Um, that's that's not my rules. That's not what, what I dictate. That's just the way it is. So you're right. Five, six years ago, when you would have a Starbucks jump on Twitter or jump on Instagram, everything seemed very new and people gravitated to that newness. But again, what is what was once new is now old. And what I will say is what was once old is now new in terms of the fact that relationships matter now more than ever. And again, such a simple concept, but I like to use this uh, this comparison. I talk about this in the book, you know, old school rules with new school tools. Business has always been built based on relationships. So they're a small to medium business all the way on up to an enterprise business. Relationships are what matter first and foremost. And the tools that we have access to today really give you the, the best opportunity to build and foster relationships. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting in the book, and it reminded me of the uh, yellow cabs out there, the taxi industry, um, because in the book, uh, in the conclusion, it says, you say, you talk about this, it's always been the customer, not the technology, and it's all, and it always will be, right? And, and so you look at somebody like the taxi cab industry that got slaughtered by, or is still being designated by all the rideshare companies, and they thought that they got put out of business or that they lost market share because of an app. And it's not the app. Um, so just the other day I was in Vegas and I decided I'm going to jump into a cab to see if they've changed their system, right? See if they've listened to the customers and are right. now trying to, you know, do something to, to deliver a better experience. It's gotten worse, you know, because when you get, when you get into a Lyft or an Uber, the cars are clean. They tend to be updated. The individual mm -hmm. driving tends to have knowledge of the city and a very good grasp of English. And right. I'm an immigrant, so I, I don't. I I will never uh, begrudge somebody coming to this country and just jumping in because you got you're here to make money. Right. So you got to also be able to uh, talk to your customers. And so in this mm -hmm. camp in Vegas, the guy barely spoke English. Didn't he'd only been in town for like three or four days and didn't know how to navigate around. So luckily I knew where I was going so I could tell him. We get to the place that he's gonna drop me off and I go to swipe my credit card and it says there's gonna be a $3 charge for using a credit card. And I'm mm -hmm. saying, I'm not paying a $3 charge. I mean, first of all, it was only a $10 fare so I'm not paying 30% mm -hmm. to take my money. And so we called the supervisor, the supervisor, sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. That, that's the fee mm -hmm. that we charge. I said, there's no way, you know, nobody charges, but you know, that kind of fee. Anyway, bottom right. line is the, the poor driver. I, I, I happen to have like six or $7 cash. He took that and went on his way. But my point being back to your, to the book, it isn't the, the, the technology that's hurting the taxi limousine industry. It's their behavior it's the fact that they're not listening to the customer here it is five six seven years later they're still not listening to the customer right. it's great they come out with an app but as you said in the book that's that's not the issue they're not listening they're not paying attention and i want to talk about this because i love mm -hmm. this um again in the book you talk about being likable but be a savage i love this what the heck is being likable but being a savage? Explain this. So here's the thing, right? In uh, in kind of like modern day pop culture, you know, millennial generation Z talk, you use the word savage a lot. When um, let me see how to put it in context. Like you know, you took someone's seat on the bus and they were about to sit down, but you swooped in. That's a savage move. So I started making these parallels and connections to pro wrestling because I'm a huge pro wrestling fan as I share in chapter three. And one of my favorite wrestlers growing up was Randy Savage. So the title of the chapter is how to be savage AF like Randy. And what I write about in chapter three is Wendy's has developed this amazing persona on social media where they're savages. They, they are unapologetically, um, you know, ragging on their competition, swooping in on their competition's followers, having these conversations. Like if Chick-fil-A tweets out, they jump into it. We recently saw it happen with Popeyes. 
So what I mean about being a digital savage, um, and just so you guys know, digital savage is now in the urban dictionary. I put it in there. Um, being a digital savage really means that you give no Fs about who you offend. And I'll share an example with you. Back in the day when I was building my business and when I was very new in this industry, I would probably send a couple hundred LinkedIn messages, blind LinkedIn messages every single day. And I was gathering people's info. I was emailing them. I was all over the, all over the map. You know, you would call it being a spammer. Um, and it's funny because back then I had so many people that were like, dude, like you're such a spammer. But at the flip side, I would walk into restaurants or a business event and people would be like, oh, hey, like you're that Carlos Skill guy. I get emails from you all the time or I always see you on the internet. And this is 2009 and 10 when the internet was still so new from a social networking standpoint. So I really teach people the methodology of being a savage in a way that you really break this down and think this is business. At the end of the day, in the world of business, you're not gonna ask for permission to transact, you're just going to execute, you're going to do, you're not going to ask for your competition's permission um, to infringe on their followers or infringe on their customers. And I'll give you an example. When I worked at Winn-Dixie, um, for those of you that are familiar with like the, you know, Southeastern United States, like, you know, hierarchy of, of, uh, of grocery chains, Publix is beloved in the Southeast, Winn-Dixie, not so much. So we would see messages every single day on Twitter of people saying, I hate Winn-Dixie, but I love Publix. And that was something that over and over I would see as a trend. And I would go to our CMO and say like, hey, we should be engaging with all these people at Love Publix and to one up Publix, let's give all these people a $25 Winn-Dixie gift card because you figure they're gonna have to go into one of our stores to use the gift card and probably buy more products. And that's an opportunity to win them over. And, and she said to me like, you know, no, Carlos, we don't want to poke the bear. We don't want to do that. But you know, that was 2012 and we're in a different era now where you have to be much more aggressive. So I'd say the easiest way for anyone to understand what it means to be a savage is be aggressive in how you market, just sitting idle and hoping that people consume your content. Social media is not going to cut it. Not only uh, is that not going to cut it? But there are so many lame offers out there. One of the one of my favorite lame offers is you know you'll see this somebody will post something on social media and they, and they offer like ten percent off. That's like <laughs> right. You know, come on, I can get ten percent off any almost any store, almost any restaurant just by asking. Hey, can I get a ten percent discount? I'm old. Give me a ten percent right. discount. You know, like you know, it, it, it's like. Uh, I like that Win Dixie example because right. you're being super aggressive, and you have to because you it's about be. winning that market share. And and you know, in, in the internet marketing space, you call it a a a bribe. You know, some kind of you know a legal bribe, some mm -hmm. kind of aggressive bribe. Where hey, come and sign up for my newsletter, and I'm gonna do this for you or whatever. You got to give reasons for people to overcome the the you know, uh, what do you call it? The, the motion, if you will, uh, the gravity that it takes, the energy that it takes to go to your website, mm -hmm. go into your store. I got to have a good reason and 10% isn't going to cut it. I, and I love this idea of being coming aggressive, have a, just a irresistible offer. Hey, come into my store. I'm going to give mm -hmm. you a $25 gift card. If they have a good experience, you're probably going to have that customer for life. It's such a simple, and you're right, it's such a simple concept. Um, I'll give you an example. A couple of nights ago, I ordered from Grubhub and my food was over an hour late. So um, if you ever order takeout and you know that first of all, when you order takeout food, it's not the same experience as when you go to a restaurant and like they serve you your food on plate hot. So my order was over an hour late. I had to call Grubhub to track it down. Then they had to call the restaurant, long story short, um, Grubhub gave me a refund of $6. My order was $30 and the refund was six bucks. I'm like, this really doesn't add up. So I messaged them privately, mind you, Bert, you know, and this is through Twitter. I, I didn't, I didn't blast them to my followers, right? I messaged them over on Twitter and I was like, Hey, look, this order came. It, it's not good quality. It's cold. It was an hour and a half late. The chips were stale. Um, you know, the chips and guacamole was smaller than what I, what I anticipated. 
Um, long story short, they then publicly, instead of replying privately, they publicly tweeted at me and they're like, hey, we're so sorry for your experience. You've been issued a partial refund. So mind you, the words matter in social media. And once you publicly tweet at me, now you're opening this conversation up to the field. You're not keeping the conversation contained privately. So now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna respond to you publicly. And my response was kind of like, kind of like, a, like an a-hole response to them. I was like, well, very clearly you wanna make this a very public conversation. Like, okay, I did not like the food at X restaurant. It was over an hour late, it was cold. I would like a full refund. And now they're tweeting back at me and they're like backpedaling and they're asking me for my email address, which is you know personal information. Instead, Grubhub could have mitigated this and just been like, you know what, we're so sorry about it. We just gave you a full refund. We hope that you will refund this again, by the way. Here's, you know, a coupon for, you know, 50 bucks off, you know, you know, enjoy $50 worth of free food on us. But you see, most brands aren't doing that. And I, I call it lazy marketing. Um, and in this era where consumers have more options and more access to put you on blast, you need to care about what people say. Otherwise, you know, negative reviews add up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you never know who you're dealing with. I mean, you don't know if that customer has no following or, you know, like in your case, somebody who might have millions of followers, you don't know where that's going to go. And, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day before social media, even before the internet, the rule of thumb was one bad customer will tell 10 people. Absolutely. Or one upset customer will tell, will tell 10 people. Uh, nowadays that one upset customer can literally tell, tens of thousands and you mentioned reviews you know my i have two teenage daughters and my twins will make a decision based on a review mm -hmm. same and, and, and so a lot of people are that way I, I i personally don't do that uh as much as i should but i'm also you know i i, I tend to ask for referrals and stuff like that but still one bad review might influence tens of thousands of people. And what's, you know, what's a $30 refund? What's a $50 credit? Nothing compared to the cost of one bad review. Yep. 100%. All right. So again, we're talking about the end of marketing uh, with Carlos Gill. And um, I, I want to talk about this. You talk about carefully mapping out your story including using a storyboard. Talk, talk about this. So it's it's really simple. A lot of folks, when they, when they try to tell stories in social media, they're just kind of posting, you know, whatever. They were kind of posting by the seat of their pants. Um, storyboarding, what it really means is having a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you're starting your story with giving some people context of like what you're going to do today. You're walking in through your progression, and then you're ending the day. Um, most stories don't need to be longer than a minute or a minute and a half because when you think of it, like, you know, if you're using Instagram stories, the maximum piece of content that you can create in the stories format is 15 seconds. So um, if you are, let's say, a real estate agent, an insurance agent, you know, you, you have your own small business and you want to really bring people behind the scenes of what you do, like give them some context instead of just arbitrarily showing, you know, anything in front of them, like give them some context like, hey, today I'm going to do X and I'm going to take you and show you this. Or if you're gonna do some sort of like, you know, Q and A or an ask me anything. So it's just really being strategic at the end of the day, Bert. I like that. Instead of just flailing about, hey, you're, you're again, you mapped it out, you're trying to achieve a certain level, or Correct. not a level, but uh, uh, distill a certain message. Correct. Are there, are there examples of companies out there that you think are doing a good job of pushing out a specific story? You know, it's it's funny because I don't follow many brands, um, and uh, I'm, I'm a consumer at the end of the day. So I don't like being sold to. I don't like being marketed marketed to. I tell you, the best examples are people. If you really want to see how storytelling should be done, social media marketing should be done. Follow people in your community. See how your local real estate agent is using social media. See how your local insurance agent is using social media. Yeah, I like that. I like that. All right, uh, let's see. Um... I want to talk about this because in the book, uh, you talk about a, a specific instance in Phoenix where you were talking to a gentleman named Sean and you told Sean companies like Best Buy and others will eventually need to hire creatives, not marketers, 
to do Such this. A good point. Yeah, in other words, talk, talk about. Such uh, a good point. Go ahead. Such a good point. So uh, I'm referring to uh, my buddy Sean Ayala. He is a content creator on Snapchat, and that's like his side hustle. And by day, he works in corporate marketing for Best Buy. And you know, we're at this conference a couple of years ago, and I told him like, Sean, you need to go to Best Buy and get them to hire like four to five of you because the skill set that Sean possesses from like an illustration standpoint, he he draws really well using a stylus on Snapchat. Like that in itself is an art form. And that is a piece of, that's a form of content marketing that influencers know really well. But if you give like a traditional graphic designer an iPhone and a stylus, they're not gonna know how to design and doodle and illustrate the same way. So I think going forward, brands will need to start hiring employees in marketing that understand storytelling, creative storytelling. They're gonna have to start hiring creatives that understand how to draw on phones. Um, I'll give you an example. The last company that I worked at, BMC Software, which is a you know, software company in B2B, the way I started hiring and building my team, um, and this is gonna sound this is gonna sound bad the way I say it because of ageism and whatnot, but I started hiring younger, right out of school professionals that understood Snapchat and Instagram marketing. Mm -hmm. Because that in itself is a skill set that's valuable to brands today if you're trying to engage a younger demographic. Same thing like right now, like TikTok. TikTok is really hot. I'm not gonna be your expert to teach you how to make music videos on TikTok. My 13 year old son is gonna be more experienced than I am in being able to teach you that, but you can't hire a 13 year old to go work for an enterprise brand, but you can hire someone right out of school is 22, 23, and they are gonna know how to speak to a younger audience. They're gonna know some of the lingo and jargon and some of the different tools and tricks of the trade. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, I think that in itself is a, a great idea, a great tip. And maybe 13 year old might be too young, but a 16 year old, 15 year old, you know, 16 year old, 17 year old, you definitely could hire somebody like that and, uh, you know, uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve. And I like this idea because again, if you're if you're trying to go after that younger market, hiring somebody like myself, I'm 57 years old, mm -hmm. I can't even remember. I can barely remember what I ate yesterday, much less trying to get to the mindset of a 19 or 20 year old, but maybe a 16 year old, or like you said, a 22 year old right out of college could. Right. Um, okay, let's talk about this. In in the book, you talk about creating a monetizable brand for yourself and your company mm -hmm. using uh, the social networks. Give give me give me some ideas. What are you talking about when you say a monetizable brand? A monetizable brand is one that people can transact with, um, you know, through social media. Like I'll give you an example. Right now, I have a book, and I'm I'm promoting that book every single day uh, by doing things like this. Every single time someone gets the book in the mail and they, they share it on their Instagram, I'm sharing it on mine. But that process started for the day that I signed the contract to the end of marketing. Um, from that day, I started building interest around the book. As I was writing the book, I would every chapter that I would write, I would share a tweet, a Facebook post, a LinkedIn post, an Instagram post of the title of the chapter. So if you followed along, there's 12 chapters in the book. You would have seen every single week as I was writing over a period of 12 weeks, there was a different chapter. And I was I was like giving you a preview in terms of what each chapter is gonna be called. Well, what happened along the uh, along the way is that people would congratulate me, clap me up, they'd show excitement, they'd ask me where they could go pre-order the book. And what I was really doing is I was bringing my audience, my community behind the scenes with me. I brought them along for the ride over a period of you know three to four months. And that in itself, is what helped me grow the end of marketing to become a bestseller very quickly. That's creating a monetizable brand. When you bring your audience behind the scenes, when you give them access, um, but also I think it's also showing the human um, element of your brand. So writing a book is not easy. Growing a business is not easy. Teaching people is easy. And if you can teach people and show them the way, then what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring them a lot closer to you. Yeah. You know what, and I think that um, something that you said there about you know writing a book not being easy, you know, uh, growing a business is not easy. Uh, I've seen people who who've established a huge fan base or a huge following talking about their mm -hmm. weight loss process, 
And I think that when you look at a lot of these influencers, you're looking at them today where they have millions of followers and man, they they seem to be on this massive level, you know, success mountain, if you will. And they don't see, you know, but, and, and and you think, man, I can't do that. But back to what you and I t- were talking about in the beginning of the show, when you talk, when you get to know somebody, when they were just laid off work and they're, mm-hmm. you know, going through that process or they just started their business, or in this case, writing a book, mm-hmm. connect with them and say, wow, this guy is sharing some, uh, you know, very, uh, very personal stuff. He's showing his vulnerability and I can connect with that. And I think a lot of people are afraid to show that sometimes no matter how good you are, no matter how great your intentions are, it's hard. Life sucks sometimes, no matter who you are. It does. And, you know, I'm so glad that you brought up the vulnerabilities aspect because I learned in 2008 and nine when life wasn't as good and when I wasn't really known um, like I am today, I learned the power of story and I learned firsthand the power of, of making yourself you know, known through your vulnerabilities. And if you're having a bad day, tell people. If you lost your job, tell people. If life isn't good, tell people. Because the reality is there's always gonna be someone else out there that can relate to you and your story. And you know, we're at this period in time now where social media is so scripted, it's fake. People are living seemingly their best life. And you know, it's having a, it's having an adverse effect on I think just you know human culture in, in general. And um, you know, I learned Back in 2008, when I lost my job, I told as many people as I possibly could about it. And it helped me get on the radar of people like yourself, for example. And yeah. it's the same thing I do nowadays, right? I'm a speaker. I share what I do. I share where I speak. Uh, I'm an author. I've been sharing the process. I'm growing a digital marketing agency. Like These are all things that are happening concurrently. And I'm just sharing. <laughs> it's so simple, man. I'm just sharing what I'm doing. And someone out there is paying attention. Sure. But I think it comes from sharing from the heart versus from the ego. And, and I think that's, 100%. The, that's the difference, right? Because like you said, everybody's on social media and everybody's having their best life ever. Well, man, I'm not having the best life ever. I just lost my job. I just got divorced. I just, 100%. You know, whatever. I just failed at this and that. All right. So uh, uh, real quick, because we're running out of time. Again, the book is called The End of Marketing. And I want to talk about this part humanizing your brand in the age of social media and AI. So let's talk here about AI specifically. How do you see, how do you see AI disrupting marketing? Talk about this. Oh man, such a good question. We could, we could record another show just around AI. Um, look, AI very simply stated is, you know, stands for artificial intelligence and the way that artificial intelligence slash AI is going to start disrupting marketing is the processes that we complete, making it a lot easier. So for example, if I want to go on Twitter and see every, if, if I'm Nike and I want to be able to identify and engage with every single person that is working out at the gym, where Reebok, um, thinking about fitness, AI will be able to identify and engage those people. If I have a business that sells, for example, real estate, um, I'll be able to identify much quicker people that are either in the process of selling their home or getting ready to, to, to buy or sell a house. Um, that all sounds great, but what it does is it, remo- it removes the human element of marketing, it removes the human element of relationship building, and that in itself can be a detriment to our society. The fact remains, Bert, that people trust people, people relate to people. We're not robots at the end of the day. We're not, you know, we're not, you know, AI ourselves. Um, so we're we're getting ready to enter this period where artificial intelligence is going to optimize processes, but it's up to us as humans to maintain um, you know, our humanistic qualities in order to um, build brands that people can relate to. Um, and, and ultimately that's going to be what saves marketing. Yeah, I like that. I like that very much. Carlos Gill, thank you so much for stopping by. Again, one more time, the book available on Amazon, The End of Marketing. And uh, if people want to reach out to you, they can go to gillmedia.co. Or is there a, is that the best place to, for them to get to know about you and, and uh, your company? Uh, you know what? Go to endofmarketingbook.com first to, uh, to get the book. And then, uh, yes, you know, uh, go to gillmedia.co or you can go to carlskill.biz and uh, I'm really easy to find all over the internet. Uh, you can add me on Twitter and Instagram at carlskill83 or just connect with me on LinkedIn. 
Great. Carlos, thank you so much. Looking forward to catching up with you again, my friend. Thank you, Bert.